Yeah. So uh, this is joint work with Natalie, and we will share uh, the speaking time uh, together. And there, there's also a third uh, author, that's Guillaume in the back of the room. So if you need to ask him questions, you can do that after the talk. So um, the work I'm, we're going to talk about is uh, taking place within the context of a French project um, with uh, four French uh, partners. And the, um, the topic of the project is bilingual reading. And basically, our, our aim is to design new visualization, visualization devices for bilingual doc documents. And there are two uh, use cases. Uh, one I'm not going to talk about is augmented electronic books. And the other one is enhanced translation checking environments for the industry. Because basically, professional translators spend a lot of time reading uh, documents or translated, doc translated documents. And when you look at the kind of uh, tools they have at their disposal to do that, they are very um, rudimentary. So the goal of the project is to enhance these tools uh, by adding, for instance, alignment information and maybe confidence estimation measures so that the uh, 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 checker can go through the document very quickly and find the areas where there are errors or potential errors and uh, uh, correct them. So when we started this project, we, we looked at, uh, at the issue of uh, um, errors in translation. And of course, as Michel said, there is a huge literature on uh, uh, errors in machine translation. And, but when you, you try to look at human errors, I mean, you sometimes even wonder if they exist. When you speak to human translators, they would say, OK, machine translation is bad, but human translation is good. So, the first question we had to solve is whether these human errors actually exist. And the, the answer is yes, they exist. And the next question, if they exist, is can we develop tools to spot them automatically? So we started looking at uh, human uh, translation errors. And the, the basic approach we took is to look at what humans do. So we, 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 studied, we started studying human error classification and uh, the ways they are used. Um, and Natalie will talk about it later. But in the long term, there is a, another potential interest in these studies is that we're getting ready for the next uh, uh, high quality machine translation. So when uh, machine translation is as good as human translation, maybe these kind of uh, errors we see now in human uh, translations will be seen as well as in machine translations. And before we start, just a small disclaimer. We, we are uh, taking human uh, as uh, as opposed to machine uh, in a very uh, narrow uh, sense. Just because, I mean, nowadays it's difficult to sort out whether the errors come from the human or, or the machine because human translators, they use machine all the time. And they use more and more machines. So at the end of the day, you don't know exactly if the error comes from the human or was already uh, produced by the machine itself. So the, the structure of the, of the talk will be, Natalie will be uh, giving a, uh, a summary of our experiment on a human, human error analysis. And then I will try to, uh, if I have time, to uh, words, uh, word out some uh, speculations about the way we could uh, devise tools to uh, identify and classify uh, human errors automatically. Yes, I'm going to talk about human errors, human translation, and uh, human assessment of uh, human translation. Um, before the 70s, translation quality assessment uh, uh, consisted mainly of a commentary on literary translation uh, made by experts in literature. Uh, it's only at the beginning of the 60s that Nida first talked about evaluating translation. So I'm not going to go through the whole history of uh, human translation evaluation, but it started as early as the 70s until today. Uh, I, I want to, um, to explain exactly what kind of translation we're talking about, because uh, uh, human translators nowadays talk about pragmatic translation as opposed to literary translation. It used to be specialized translation, but we preferred pragmatic translation 
uh, in which pragmatic denotes the uh, readership's, readership's reception of the translation, uh, which focus on the perlocutionary effect of the translation in the target language. So pragmatic translation, uh, the objective is to convey the message of the author with the intent of the author as clearly and as precisely as possible to a specific readership who also have expectations. So uh, translation quality evaluation takes place in professional settings, but also in educational settings with different, ob different objectives. Unfortunately, there is no universal framework to evaluate translation. Even uh, the ISO 9000 series uh, do not manage to standardize uh, the evaluation of translation because it is context dependent. And, uh, however, the most efficient way to evaluate translation is to try to categorize the, error, the errors and uh, maybe weight them. So why are typologies, categorization of error, useful? Well, obviously, first of all, to provide a framework uh, to co a translation company uh, to assess the quality of the translation and evaluate the time needed to correct it, if necessary. Uh, it also, it's also helpful to uh, gain time because there are very strict procedures. Uh, it's uh, vital for translation companies to have evaluation procedures in case an accident happens, in case a serious error in the translation happened, because uh, serious error, errors can have consequences such as death, human injury, product recall, or they can embarrass the client, for example, if there is a high-profile spelling or grammatical error in the title of the translated text and things like that. So it's uh, vital for company to protect them, themselves from being sued in showing that they have very specific pro quality assurance procedures. In the educational settings, uh, translation quality assessment and typologies are very, very useful to help students understand how they are evaluated because very often they have the, the feeling that the evaluation is subjective and they try to adapt to the subjectivity of each teacher. So to have a typology is useful in this uh, area. It's also useful uh, for them to improve their translation skills because the typology indicates that to them where the error is, on what points, and what they have to improve, such as terminology or taking registers into account and so on. So um, I'm going to show you a few models, especially professional models, because I'm going to talk to you afterwards about the Melange project in which we devised the typology based on professional models. Well, the American Association for Translation proposes a typology including 22 error categories uh, in a wide variety of uh, errors. Uh, the uh, interesting thing in this model is that each reviser can weight the error. Not saying this is a minor error or this is a major error, but the, the annotator can give from 1 to 16 points to the error. The problem with this model is that there are no guidelines telling the annotators how to evaluate, how to choose how many points the error is worth. The Association for uh, Translation and Interpreting uh, in the UK, ITI, also provides their members with an error typology, uh, eight, 18 error types, but no weighting. So you cannot say whether the error is major or, m or minor. An interesting model that, that was developed at the beginning of the year 2000 was the SAEJ2450, uh, okay? Uh, which has been developed by the automotive uh, industry in the US. It was interesting because there were very few categories, but mainly aimed at uh, uh, evaluating content, and the interesting thing was that you could weight the error. Uh, and there were guidelines to tell you how to decide. For example, in doubt, always choose major over minor. 
the most successful models uh, in the year 2000 was the blackjack model, which also was a tool for annotating with a typology. Uh, the annotators could choose the type of error and then the system would automatically add a weight to the error and calculate a finite score afterwards. It's important also to note that, yes, in some cases, error um, focus on the origin of the error and not on the result of the error in the target language which means that you need a human interpretation when you focus on the origin. For example, misunderstanding of the source text means that you have to know that the source text has been mis misinterpreted. So uh, it's better, in fact, to focus on the result because you don't have to think of what happens in the, co in the translator's head. Uh, I have been looking at uh, what's uh, going on in the EU um, there is no real typology of error, but some linguistic, uh, uh, some tips for the translator. And what's very interesting is that the recommendation for the translators, for example, forbid omissions or additions, which are usually part of all error typologies. Mm -hmm. But we'll see later that omission and additions can be perfectly acceptable and correct in a translation. So the Melange project, well, I'm not going to read what the aim of the project was. We can have it on the slide. Uh, what's interesting here is that we compile a, a learner translator corpus in several EU languages. And the corpus was, apart from being classically tagged, it was manually annotated according to an error typology in order to um, um, to, uh, to see what kind of errors uh, students made and also in order to improve translation training with the use of this typology and the results uh, we got. So this is how the typology look. It's divided into content error and uh, uh, language errors. And uh, in fact, when you look at this typology, you can see that some error errors are general uh, they, they appear in all domains and genres uh, in the language, but other errors are uh, domain and genre dependent. For example, terminology errors depend on the domain you're working on. Uh, register errors depend on the genre. Okay. And okay, this is the rest of the typology. So the, the typology was translated into the other partner's language to facilitate uh, the annotation by the annotators. And of course, we discovered that it was really difficult to agree uh, on some types of error. Because you can, when you have an error on a segment, you, you can give, it happens that you can give two different types of errors. And uh, we had regular on-site meetings and regular projects meeting to discuss. But in the end, uh, we, sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's really difficult to know uh, what kind of error it is or if it is really an error. So, well, here are some examples of uh, errors in the, in the learner translator corpus. So this is, the first one is a content error distortion. Um, well, yes, uh, advantages and reductions are not the same thing. Okay. And the second one is the language error, which is, uh, which is domain dependent, because in this domain, the correct term for medical officer in French is médecin conseil. So it's domain dependent and probably glossary dependent. And this is in one of the recommendations the EU gives to translators, for example. Well, I'm going to skip the other errors because it's just some more examples. I just want to show you uh, two examples of fuzzy category. Here, uh, this is an example which is not, okay, from the Melange project, but from a project one of our master's students have to do in the second year of the master's. So she had to translate a text on coral bleaching from English into French. 
and she had to compile a comparable corpus of uh, articles in English and in French in the domain. And in analyzing the corpus, we noticed that uh, the English writers use, uh, used much more hedging devices than the French writers. They were much more cautious about this bleaching crisis, probably because uh, expecting more financing than the French writers. So even though the first sentence in French, which is uh, correctly translated and which uses all the hed hedging devices that are uh, in the English text, it's not completely adapted to the French way of, t of saying things in this domain. So the second sentence, which uses less hedging devices and which states that there is a serious crisis, the seriousness of the situation is much more adapted to the French readership. So this is not an error, but this is not as appropriate as it should be. And just another example, omission, in this case, no quantitative estimate exists of the amount of these gases. This is from an earth science uh, translation. Um, in French, you cannot say, il n'existe aucune estimation quantitative de la quantité de gaz, because it's too redundant. So you can just get, drop the quantitative. It's an omission, but it's perfectly correct. So what is really an error in those error typologies? Oui, mais ça, OK. The other example was just to show you that an addition could also be perfectly correct. Because here, uh, the, the, the expression to d'abord has been added and is not in the English sentence. But it's perfectly correct. So, oh yes, I just wanted to say something. An error depends on the requirement uh, of the client, on the recommendations of the client. It's, it's a register dependent, it's domain dependent. And of course, it's always very subjective. So, I'm gonna continue. So needless to say, when we uh, discovered that there was these uh, typologies, we were at the same time very happy to discover, to, to learn from, uh, from uh, uh, human error analysis. But we were also a bit uh, worried because we discovered that the uh, error range uh, ranges from very obvious errors like typographical errors. They, they are very important and you see that in every uh, recommendation. And that's very obvious to spot, but they go to very subtle errors like uh, Nathalie just showed, and that, would, that won't be so easy to, to, to detect. Uh, the other thing we learned that errors can be precisely localized even though you don't have, you don't have a, a, a reference translation. So that's something we, we discovered as well. That is, human annotators, they can spot errors without having a, a complete translation of the sentence. And that's useful to know. And the, 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 the last thing I wanted to mention is, uh, as uh, Nathalie said, uh, errors uh, can be categorized as well by uh, seriousness. And that's really uh, something that uh, we need to uh, look into. So given these uh, uh, observations, the next question is how much hope do we have to detect human errors automatically? So uh, starting to think about this, we uh, tried to take inspiration um, from two uh, very close uh, domains. The first one is uh, spelling, uh, spell checking, and uh, the second one is confidence estimation. So I'll go briefly into the kind of analogies we can, we can make with these domains. So you know that modern spell checkers are basically uh, data-based, uh, and they have two main components. One is a language model that, that is typically uh, n-gram models for, for the local context, and maybe the, mo uh, the most sophisticated one use stochastic grammars at the sentence level, or maybe topic, uh, topic models for uh, capturing long-range uh, uh, dependencies. And the other component is the error model. And the error model usually includes uh, frequent uh, letter confusions, maybe phonetic sim similarities, and also uh, homophones, and in the best cases, it can be trained on genre and register as well, just because the, uh, for instance, uh, uh, 
depending on the kind of text you have to correct, the uh, confusions may be more or less uh, uh, phonetic or not. So can we use this analogy for, uh, I'm going to skip that, can we use this analogy for doing uh, translation checking? It's not so clear because, I mean, the co language model component can be reused almost as it is, but the error model in translation is not so easy to devise. How can we come up with a uh, proper uh, error model? That's a difficult question. So there, be, there has been some attempts to, for instance, uh, devise a list of FOSAMI uh, terms for specific language pairs or to look at syntactic analogies the way uh, for, for instance, French learners would typically use French constructs in, German, in, in English. But it, in any case, it would have to be language pair dependent and also probably domain register and genre dependent. And it would be really tedious to build this uh, kind of uh, error models. The, the other analogies we, we've looked at is uh, quality estimation. So we had a nice talk yesterday by Lucia. So you now know that uh, confidence estimation systems are mostly database. And the way they work is they just take an annotated corpus with a source and target sentence and some quality measures and use machine learning to train a confidence estimation system. So the question is, can we do that to perform a human, oh, sorry for the typo, typo uh, human quality estimation? The first thing we would need to have is a, is a corpus with annotated uh, human errors. And I, as, I, I was, as I will explain later, we don't have that yet. But assuming that this uh, <coughs> corpus would exist, then we would have to, the next difficult question is feature extraction. What kind of feature will be useful to detect uh, human errors? And that's not so clear at the moment that the uh, kind of feature we use for uh, <coughs> confidence estimation of machine translation would be useful for human translation as well. <coughs> so the first experiment we made uh, going in that direction is to uh, try to compare translation from uh, various sources so we compare three types of translations. Uh, one set of translations are fully automatic translation from a, a rule-based system and also from a syntax, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, statistical-based system. We also took post-edited versions of these two systems. On uh, uh, the last set of translations, we have three translations of the same sentences. So for uh, 2,000 sentences, we have five different translations. And then we ask ourselves the questions, can be uh, distinguish this kind of translations automatically. So we, we trained uh, a typical quality uh, estimation system where the task was not to guess the quality of a, of, a, of, a, of a translation, but rather to tell whether it was a human translation or a post-edited human translation, or was it a machine translation. And uh, <clears throat> the main result of this study is it's really difficult to distinguish empty output from post-edited empty output. But at the same time, it's possible, I mean, with uh, uh, some confidence to distinguish between empty and free translation. So there is some hope that with these very crude techniques, we can still uh, be able to uh, produce a, um, uh, an interesting uh, uh, measurement of whether the text is uh, uh, um, correctly uh, translated or not. Uh, so the, the last thing I want to mention is that this is a, a starting a project, so we are uh, actively uh, trying to uh, figure out ways to, uh, first of all, uh, get uh, some, um, something out of the melange corpus, although it's, uh, it's difficult because it was built in a very diff different context, so it contains very few uh, source sentences with many translations for the same sentences, so it's, it's uh, not so easy to see how we could uh, train machine, trans uh, uh, machine learning system uh, on it. Uh, and the other thing we have started to do is to collect uh, data uh, so that we can next uh, train our systems. So we are uh, trying to do that with several uh, kinds of scientific texts. And I guess I stop there. Thank you.
when the score of the human translation, is, or the, the, when the human translation is scored by two by translations. So, yeah, what we're doing is basically uh, uh, calculate the alignment probability of the human translation of the source target by the p-system, and if the score is bad, then it may be error. I mean, it, it would be as simple as that, but basically you would have to use this kind of features, that is, uh, alignment features to score, uh, I mean, it's what we tried, and obviously there is some signal there, but of course you, you cannot tell in which sense it acts, I mean, sometimes it's because it's using the, it can be the case that it's using the, uh, um, I mean, alignments that have a high score, typically they may be bad. <laughs> Just because, I mean, the uh, free translation, they are not so literal, and they would uh, sometimes use uh, uh, alignments that you haven't seen in your corpus. And that would be a sign of quality, for instance, that uh, they... I was just wondering, now, with what you were saying about the annotation of errors, you said that if you define errors according to... You define errors according to, to the client. Yes. Did you ever, this is a curiosity, did you ever bump into problems like what is an error, what is a preference? People co over correcting, over pinpointing, you know, errors. Uh, you mean in the annotation of the corpus? Yeah. In the annotation of the corpus, yeah. Because the, the boundary between an error is. Uh, and a preference. And a preference is very, very difficult. Yes, uh, well, in that case, uh, well, we had a reference corpus that we didn't use to annotate the errors, but in that case, we could have access to the reference corpus to see what it, it, whether it was really an error or a preference. But um, in fact, as the, the text we, we we choose were quite specialized. This question uh, didn't occur very often because when you were ordering a very specialized domain, then you don't you don't have the choice. You have to be consistent with the domain. My answer. Mm -hmm. And they were never tempted to over rewrite things or stuff like this. Mm -hmm. I, I say this because I mean it's a problem we normally run into when we are asking people just to correct the minimum in translation, they tend to have this, you know, this unstoppable need to <laughs> correct. <laughs> you know, it's like a coma or whatever. Well, and maybe you, I don't know, if the typology was... I don't know, I mean, I don't know what, what you mean when you say a coma. I mean, what is expected of professional translators? is to provide the translation that is perfect with a text that is imperfect. Because in pragmatic translation, very often, the source text contains error, uh, or uh, syntactic errors even, or are not really well written, because uh, not all source texts have been written by technical writers. So you have an imperfect text. And what is expected of the translator is to provide a perfect text. This is why translators are obsessed with commas and, and dots and things like that. Because punctuation is very important. Your text has to be perfect on our levels. So uh, about, you were asking the question about the annotators. The annotators were all translation trainers. Okay. So, uh, but they tried to annotate the text uh, according to uh, what they taught <coughs> their students. And what, what we are teaching, all the partners were, tra well, most of the partners were translation schools training professional translators who were, who had to make internship inter inter with uh, private companies. So we tried to train them as professionally as possible. One more quick question. Talk <coughs> about the gravity and the weight of errors. Yeah. Could you give, give us some decision about how you can decide an error is a huge one, a major or a minor one? Well, that's mm -hmm. a good question. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's really, it really impairs the comprehension. I mean, really, you cannot, 
if it's really, really different from the source text, it's a major error. And that's one point. Uh, if, uh, if the intent of the source text remains understandable, that's a minor error. Now, as I said, this is all context dependent. I mean, even a typo could be a major error. Imagine you know, the, the annual financial report of the Swiss bank. You cannot accept to have a typo in the report. It has to be perfect. And also uh, about terminology, um, you have to be uh, consistent throughout the translation of terminology, always using the same equivalent so you see the same term in the sources. So if you use another equivalent, this can be a serious error depending on the context, which is why it's very difficult to tell whether an error is serious or not. One interesting uh, approach uh, would be to, to try to guess, well, to evaluate how much time is needed to correct the error. So if, if, if you can do it just like that, by time and replace, it's a minor error. If you have to completely read it, it's a minor error. Let's thank the speakers. Great.